how do you go from being an NBA star, playing alongside Kobe Bryant? Over the shoulder on a reverse, no luck. Jamaris Critton and Kobe, you like it? I guess so. To a notorious gangster facing life in prison for murder. You said you know who did the shooting? Uh, yeah, the basketball player, Crimson. This is the story of Javaris Crittenton. <laughs> Javaris was the last person you'd expect to become a murderer. Because growing up in the projects of Atlanta during the early 2000s, he was a straight-A student, class president, and a basketball phenom. In fact, by the time Javaris graduated high school in 06, he was a McDonald's All-American, and had received the D1 scholarship to Georgia Tech. And after only a year playing college ball, Javaris earned his greatest achievement yet, being a 2007 first-round draft pick for the LA Lakers, and signing a $2.6 million contract. Yeah, I was just excited, you know, to be a Laker. You can't even walk in the building, you're stormed by fans. <laughs> At just 19 years old, Javaris was an NBA star, playing next to Kobe Bryant. He was on top of the world, but one night changed everything. See, one night during his first offseason, Javaris was out partying at the Block nightclub in Hollywood when someone caught his eye from across the room. Famous Atlanta rapper, Dalla, surrounded by his crew, flashing diamond chains, beautiful women, and designer clothes. A young Javaris was mesmerized, so he decided to introduce himself, only to find out that Dalla and his crew were part of a notorious LA street gang, the Mansfield Gangster Crips. And with Javaris being a professional athlete and all, he should have just walked away right then and there. But instead, he was so enticed by the gangster lifestyle that he hung out with Dalla and his crew all night long. And over the next couple of months, Javaris grew even closer to the gang until eventually he became an official Mansfield Crip. Now, Javaris may have been making waves on the streets, but his basketball career was a completely different story. Because after joining the gang, Javaris was never able to gain his footing in the NBA. He went from the Lakers to the Grizzlies to the Wizards, all in just his first two seasons. And in December of 2009, his struggling basketball career went completely off the deep end. During a team flight to Washington, Javaris decided to pass the time by gambling on card games with his teammates. And after losing thousands of dollars, Javaris was pissed. So in the heat of the moment, he ended up getting into a fight with his teammate. Gilbert Arenas, threatening to rob the guy. Javaris is in her gangster was showing, and he wanted to settle the beef like a real Mansfield Crip. So a couple of days later, Javaris pulled up to the Wizards Arena and walked into the team's locker room with a loaded weapon. And after a heated exchange, Javaris found himself in a Wild West standoff with Gilbert Arenas. Now luckily, both guys eventually calmed down and no one ended up hurt. But that didn't stop the incident from being reported to the police. So a few weeks later, Javaris was charged with misdemeanor possession of a firearm and was sentenced to one year of probation. And following a sentencing, Javaris's contract with the Wizards was terminated. After just two and a half years, 22-year-old Javaris was officially out of the NBA. This seemed like rock bottom, but in reality, it was just the tip of the iceberg. See, getting kicked out of the NBA left Javaris devastated, so he decided to fly back to Atlanta, looking for the support of his family. But what he got instead was judgment and rejection. The people that once saw him as a hometown hero now saw him as a failure. And as a result, Javaris turned to the only people that he felt would accept him, the Mansfield Gangster Crips. And by spring of 2010, Javaris had become a ride or die member of the gang going as far as helping the Crips duck police and even put money in their jail accounts. But eventually, all of his boys got locked up. So when no one else to turn to and nowhere else to go, Javaris decided to make a last ditch effort at an NBA comeback, trying out for the Charlotte Bobcats only to fall flat on his face. By 2011, Javaris fell alone and hopeless. At just 23 years old, he had no job, was rejected by his family, and his closest friends were dead or in prison. Feeling like he had nothing else to lose, 
Javaris became a ticking time bomb, ready to explode at any moment. All he needed was a little push over the edge. And that push came on a dark Atlanta night, when, after leaving a local barber shop, Javaris was robbed of everything he had on him. His $25,000 black diamond necklace, his $30,000 black diamond watch. I mean, he even got robbed for his iPhone and 25 bucks. All by a rival gang member that Javaris recognized. 17-year-old ROC crew member, Lil Tick. And after everything Javaris had been through, this was the final straw. He wanted to find Lil Tick and get revenge. On August 19th, 2011, at 9.30 p.m., Javaris was in the backseat of a rented Chevy Tahoe, with his cousin Scooter up front, driving him to Lil Tick's last known location, Glen Rose Heights, just outside of Atlanta. And as he turned on to make and drive, Javaris spotted this target on the sidewalk and opened fire. But instead of hitting Lil Tick, Javaris missed and accidentally hit an innocent woman. So with this, Panic Javaris Crittenton fled the scene, as witnesses called the cops. After medics arrived, the woman was rushed to Grady Memorial Hospital, where just two hours later, at 11.34 p.m., she was pronounced dead, making Javaris Crittenton a stone-cold killer. Atlanta now on emergency operator 44. And the police to make them drive, and they had a drive-by. And you said you know who did the shooting? Uh, yeah, the basketball player. C-R-I-T-T-E-N-T-O-N. Just a few days after the murder, Javaris fled to LA as police began their investigation. And over the next week, they gathered tons of evidence linking Javaris to the crime. Witness statements, his photo being picked out of a police lineup, and the discovery of the rented Chevy Tahoe coated with residue and Javaris' fingerprints. So police obtained an arrest warrant, and a couple of days later, the FBI arrested Javaris in LA, but it wouldn't be until April of 2015 that his day in court would finally come. By this point, there was so much evidence against Javaris that a life sentence seemed inevitable. So on the very first day of his murder trial, he struck a deal with prosecutors. In exchange for dropping several charges, Javaris pled guilty to aggravated assault with a firearm and voluntary manslaughter. And as a result, he was sentenced to 23 years in federal prison. So, as of this recording, Javaris is being held at Calhoun State Prison in Georgia, where, pending good behavior, he has an expected release date of December 13th, 2036.